Hi, I'm Chrissy Miles, and you're watching The Chrissy Miles Show, where I teach you how to take eternal truth and produce extreme results. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the mystery of Christmas. <laughs> But before we begin, subscribe to this channel and click the bell to get notified of more of my proven methods to get more out of life. Let's get started. Hey, welcome back to the Chrissy Miles Show. I want to talk to you today about what I'm calling the mystery of Christmas. And sometimes people forget about the sort of nuances of scripture when you talk about the story of Christmas and what it's really all about. The meaning of Christmas often gets lost. But when we talk about the mystery of Christmas, I want to start by looking at a verse in Jeremiah chapter 31. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31. So in Jeremiah 31, um, one of the most important things to realize about this particular prophet is that he was sent during a very difficult time in Israel. And Jeremiah's primary objective was to actually warn the people that a calamity was coming to them because of the sins of their forefathers, the sins of the nations. They had forgotten God. They had rejected God. And there were a lot of prophets that had come forth trying to sort of persuade Israel that, hey, I've, I've heard this word from the Lord and he said everything is going to be okay. And really that is quite the opposite of of what he was actually saying. In fact, he was warning them to come back to their senses. And he even spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. And what transpired is that they were actually led out of Israel into Babylon, into captivity under King Nebuchadnezzar. So in this particular passage towards the end of the book of Jeremiah, this is the promise that God made to the people through Jeremiah. He says, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, it will not be like the covenant that I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and I led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. And he continues, he says in verse 33, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after that time. I will put my law in their minds, I will write it on their hearts, I will be their God, and they will be my people. So one of the things that God is actually prophesying through Jeremiah is not only about, you know, the destruction of Israel and the fact that they were going to be led out of captivity, but also that he was getting ready to do something new. And this, in fact, is one of the mysteries of Christmas, is that through Jesus Christ, this prophecy that was spoken about in terms of the relationship that God wanted to have with his children moving forward, is that through Jesus, that God was about to embrace his children with a new covenant. And it wasn't going to be like the covenant that he made with them when he led them out of Egypt. And of course, the story of them uh, being led out of Egypt is the story of Moses and the Ten Commandments. But you see, God is saying, I'm getting ready to do something new. Now, they're going to go through this period of time where they're going to suffer the consequences of not following me, but he says, I'm getting ready to do something new. And this is so significant and so substantial because what we see in the life of Jesus is that when Jesus comes into this world, he actually is the officiant of the new covenant. He is the person who oversees the new covenant. Everything about this new relationship that God is making between himself and his people hinges on what Jesus is going to do. And notice that part of this covenant is that the law, right? The law of God, the precepts of God, the, the rules of God, the parameters of God, everything about the nature of God. He said, I'm going to put this law in their minds and I'm going to write this law on their hearts. You know, that's one of the most compelling New Testament revelations, I believe, uh, for, for Christians to really come to grips with or to understand is that when we receive this new covenant, it is not like the old covenant. It is a different relationship that God has made with us where he puts his law on our minds and he writes them on our hearts. What that means is, is that through this new relationship with God, no longer Longer do we have to worship God from a distance? We don't have to worship him from afar. We don't have to have a mediator between us and God in the same way that they did under the old covenant because his laws and his precepts are now part of our thought process when we become, you know, faith-filled believers and his laws are written on our hearts, meaning that we know uh, the precepts of God to such a degree that when we are, are interacting with one another, there's a sense internally in the spirit realm of the 
God's God's perspective or his his um, process for for handling all these situations and these problems that we face and these difficulties that we see. So when he says, I will be their God and they will be my people, he then goes on to say in verse 34, no longer will a man teach his neighbor saying, know the Lord, because everybody will know me from the least to the greatest. And then he ends with this. He says, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. So back even before Jesus, you know, came onto the scene, God was prophesying through Jeremiah that there would be a time that would be coming that all of these terrible consequences that the nation of Israel were getting ready to experience in their exile in Babylon, that that was going to be a thing of the past, that God was going to right all the wrongs because no longer was he going to be making a covenant with just a mere human in that sense, that he was getting ready to make a covenant with a, a, a God man, which essentially was Jesus. Now look at what it says about Jesus at his birth. When the angels come on the scene announcing to the shepherds about the miraculous coming of the Messiah, here's what they say. So look at Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 12. This is what the angels say. It says, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. And it says that the angels then proclaimed in verse 14 of Luke chapter 2, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. You might have heard this in another verse or in another translation even that they said, glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. But here he says that the announcement of Jesus' birth caused the angels to proclaim that we can give glory to God, meaning we praise him, uh, we, we exalt him for who he is because now there is peace on earth And it says that his favor now rests on men, meaning that the story of Jeremiah and the prophecy that he had given was now becoming fulfilled through the messenger, Jesus. That as a man that was born into this world with human flesh, but having literally the DNA of God being supernaturally conceived through the Holy Spirit, having the essence and the nature of perfection, even though he had poured out everything that was of the Godhead in terms of his power, right, or his supernatural abilities while he was here on this earth, he still had that perfection of God that was now part of his existence and his being. So literally through the mysterious and miraculous birth of Jesus, there is now a new nature, a new type of man that has entered into our atmosphere, it's entered into our world. And that man is the kind of man that God was attempting to, to create in the garden. In fact, writers in the New Testament call Jesus the second Adam. He was the second Adam in the sense that he was born into this world physically, but he had a perfect nature. And in fact, the life of Jesus was evidentiary of his perfection in that the Bible claims that he was never with sin. He never sinned. So what God was saying in these two stories of Jeremiah forecasting and prophesying about Jesus coming, and then with the announcement and the pronouncement of Jesus' birth through the angels, is that God had a relationship with mankind that was based on mankind's ability to follow the rules and the precepts and the laws of God in order to find favor with him. And they always fell short in that. And if you look throughout the history of, of the Israelites, they were constantly back and forth between the tribes of Judah and the nation of Israel and Jerusalem, where the fathers and the kings, if you will, they would follow God for a while, and then they would go back into their ways of following pagan gods. This this continued for hundreds and hundreds of years to the point where they suffered so, uh, so terribly because they weren't following God's rules that they literally just started experiencing the consequences of their own actions. There was division, there was strife, it caused them to be weakened as a nation. Eventually they were led off into captivity, but even in the midst of them being led off into captivity, God was saying, a time is coming where the whole relationship that I have between myself and mankind will be different. It's going to be based upon a new arrangement, an arrangement that I make with my son, who is part man, part God, the second Adam. And when Jesus himself fulfills all of the righteous requirements of the law, this is now when 
as we receive Jesus, we have these precepts written on our heart. We have the fulfillment of righteousness. Now, when we put our faith in Jesus, every benefit and blessing that God bestowed on Jesus, his son, we now receive, including and primarily right standing with God the Father, not based upon our behavior. This is a relationship that God prophesied would happen in our hearts and in our minds. Now, of course, we see the benefit of having Jesus written on our hearts and, and present in our minds and that it guides our behavior and our actions. But you see, the relationship that God had prior to this was one that was really primarily based on their physical actions. If they did this, they got something good. If they did not follow God, they got things that were bad. They, they basically received the consequences of their actions, even though... God said that he wanted to have a relationship with him on a heart-to-heart -heart level. We see certain stories of that throughout scripture that he did have a relationship with people, but primarily people were so darkened in their understanding of God. They were so afraid of God. They were afraid because of their sin. It kept them separate from God that they essentially just pulled back from him and they did not have a relationship with him the way that he intended. So the mystery, part of the mystery of Jesus coming onto the scene was not just about his miraculous birth, although that certainly is a mystery in some cases, but part of the mystery that Jesus was carrying with him is that he was, in fact, the officer of the new covenant. He was the one through his life, through his ministry, through his supernatural birth and then his death and his supernatural resurrection, through him, the second Adam, he was to be the, the crux, the culmination of everything that God intended to bestow on mankind in the garden, that Jesus would put all of that together. He would ratify all of that. He would forever take away the obstacle that prevented us from having the fellowship and the relationship with God and the benefit of knowing God in our heart. He would right every wrong and he would be the fulfillment and the overseer of that covenant in his blood. So not only did he, he uh, author that covenant in some cases, but he also fulfilled that covenant and now he oversees that arrangement with God. It's an arrangement and a contract between God and man. But it's not just an arrangement and a contract between God and fallible man. It's an arrangement and a contract between God and Jesus, the perfect man. That because Jesus was able to fulfill all the righteous requirements of the law, that now God's favor rests on men. It's quite a profound thought to actually put yourself in the position as the recipient of God's good favor. And one of the ways that you can envision yourself as the recipient of God's good favor, and which is the mystery of Jesus, is that because God favors Jesus, when I am in Jesus Christ, God favors me. And he writes his laws on my heart. He brings them forth in my mind. And one of the blessings of that is so that I can walk in such a way that I don't do damage to my heart. I don't create uh, problematic circumstances in my life that wreak havoc on my life. I walk in such a way that I'm following the guideposts of what God's word says in his nature, which prevents me from falling into destruction. There's a very strong reason why the prophet Jeremiah was given these words about the forthcoming Messiah and how these two things connect because Jeremiah was in the midst of literally, you know, centuries long struggle that the Israelites had after having left Egypt, having never really fully, fully experienced the fruit and the benefit that was God's intention for them when they left Egypt because so many of their kings and so many of their leaders had fallen out of relationship with God by not following his rules and his precepts, by not living according to the law. And every time their leaders did that, it created problems for the nation to the point where it culminated in them literally being exiled from the land that he had sworn to give them. So when Jesus comes on the scene, the angels say, now I have favor with, with man again, this favor is so profound because it's not just about having things restored back to us physically. 
It's about having things restored back to us spiritually. And from that place spiritually where God's laws are written on our hearts and in our minds, it literally creates a path for us that we never in our spirits actually stray away from God. You might stray away in some of your thoughts occasionally. You might stray away in some of your actions, but in your spirit, because your spirit is united with God in a, in a realm that cannot be seen except for by faith, that is the part of you that now maintains the fulfillment of God's precepts and his laws and his commands perfectly all the time, which means that if you uh, submit yourself to the spirit, as Paul would say, you will live because the spirit will always guide you down paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The Bible says the spirit will always, uh, guide you in the precepts of God effortlessly because that's where the spirit walks. That's where the spirit dwells. That's the mindset of the spirit. His life is, is based upon life and peace. So when we have that reality in us, that mystery of Jesus living on the inside of us, it's not just about the, you know, uh, one aspect of, you know, having a relationship back with God, but it's about the culmination of the favor that God had with Jesus Christ now being placed on us. And that favor benefits us, not just in having a, a present tense relationship with God that's, you know, full of life, full of peace, free from, uh, free from sin, free from obligation, but it has a profound effect on the future in the way we live out our life. So many Christians struggle today, not being able to operate in the grace and the favor of God simply because they do not understand fully what it means to be included in Jesus Christ. And they have not fully received the favor that God bestowed on Jesus for themselves because they still see themselves as being different than Jesus. They see themselves as being not as good, not as holy, not as righteous and so forth. But of course, the mystery of Christ was that he was righteous when I couldn't be. He lived a sinless life when I could not do that. And because he was able to fully fulfill and live up to every expectation of the law, because he saw God, he knew the heart of God, that he was able to um, follow God in his precepts because he understood what the law represented in its holiness and its purity and his heart desired to live that way. He bestowed upon us the favor that he himself received from God. That is part of the mystery of Christmas. Now, Jesus himself, when, you know, we had the story of Luke of how the angels are proclaiming that, you know, now there is favor between God and man because of the birth of Jesus. Jesus himself verifies the fulfillment and the culmination of that favor when he speaks of how we should now relate to God. So in Matthew chapter six, verse nine, you all know this is the Lord's prayer, but let's read it together. He says, our father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So Jesus himself knew and understood that because of the nature of who he was and his position before God, his role that he played in the fulfillment of God's promises to mankind on this earth, because of everything that he knew that he was, and his purpose for his life, he said, this is how you should relate to God. You should relate to him from the standpoint that you desire to see his kingdom come on earth and his will be done as it is in heaven. What I always say is that Jesus became the bridge between the kingdom of God and this earth or the kingdom of heaven even and this earth. He is the central figure that reached into the heavenly realms and grasped and understood, had firsthand knowledge and information of all of who God was and the miraculous power of God, the nature of God, the kindness of God, the love of God, the manifestation of God and all of his goodness. And because of Jesus, who had access to that realm, because that is the realm from which he came, he brought that into this physical earth in which we live. 
which was why he was able to say with confidence and encourage us to say that because of Jesus, we can pray for God's will to be done here on earth exactly as it is in heaven. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is the gateway. Jesus is the portal between God's kingdom realities and his favor, his nature, his laws, his precepts, his goodness, his righteousness, his holiness. He is the portal and the gateway to see every bit of who God is made manifest, not just in our earth physically, although that is true, but it's made manifest in our hearts. And when that reality becomes true to us in our heart, or we believe in that to such a degree that we walk in that, we then carry out the Lord's purpose in our own lives personally and in the lives of the other people that we touch in this world. It's a mystery. We're talking about the mystery of the birth of Jesus, the mystery of Christ at Christmas. When you begin to unravel the nature of the story of Jesus, not just the story of Jesus, but the purpose behind it and what his true mission was and what he actually accomplished, what God says about the prophecy that was spoken long ago, that his desire would be that that he would have a whole new relationship with people that was not based upon our actions because he saw that we would go often astray, but that our benefit and our favor would come through the one man who was able to perfectly uh, be an example of who God is to us in this world. When those things start becoming real to you as a, as a believer, as a Christian, then the story of Christmas takes on a whole new meaning because it's a story that takes place every day of our lives, not just once a year, but it's a story that you can, you can live, that you can um, relate to. It's a story that you can actually have a relationship with God through when you understand the mystery of Jesus. I hope you enjoyed this message. We're going to continue on in this series on the mysteries of Christmas. Uh, I'll share with you again next week as we talk a little bit about the fulfillment of these prophecies that were spoken about with Jesus. Hey, I have a free checklist for you though. It's my eight ways to get more out of life. Download this checklist. You know, these eight steps that I want to share with you on how to get more out of life is exactly the process that God took me through when I was coming out of the most deepest, darkest places in my life. He showed me these eight steps. And as I followed these steps and I rebuilt my relationship with God, my life totally turned around and I was able to start getting the most out of life, the life that he died for me to have. I want you to have this too. So download my eight tips to get more out of life and join me again each Tuesday where I teach you how to get more out of life. Thanks for watching.